Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to CoachX Conversations with the Institute of Coaching Live. I am Jeff Hull, the Director of Education at the Institute of Coaching, and I am really excited to be with you again this week uh, to interview one of my favorite, favorite people in the world, a good friend and colleague. And uh, I have to be honest, um, I'm a little nervous about this interview and a little intimidated, but um, very excited. Uh, I had the opportunity to do a webinar with Dory Clark last week at the Institute of Coaching. And um, so she calmed me down about the fact that we were gonna do this interview together today. And I would encourage you, those of you um, that would love to take a deeper dive into some of the work that we'll probably discuss a little bit today, to go to the instituteofcoaching.org where you can have access to the one hour long webinar that we did with Dory last week. So I want to introduce you to Dory Clark. She is someone that many of you will already know. She is, has been named one of the top 50 business thinkers in the world by Thinkers 50. She was recognized as the number one communications coach in the world by Marshall Goldsmith's Leading Global Coaches Awards. She's a consultant, a keynote speaker. She teaches educa executive education at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. And you've probably heard of a number of her best-selling books, Entrepreneurial You, Reinventing You, and Stand Out, which was the number one leadership book of 2015 by Inc. Magazine. She's a dear friend and thought leader with the Institute of Coaching, and it's really a privilege. I had the opportunity to be on her Newsweek show early on when my book came out, and uh, I'm just super excited to get to kind of reverse the rules and ask you all the questions that I've always wanted to ask. So, Dory, it's really wonderful to have you. I appreciate it, Jeff. So great to be here. So let's start with a little bit of content. I want to welcome everyone from around the world that's joining us, uh, folks that are coming in from all across the world at different time zones, and we'll try to get to some of your questions if we can. So please put your questions in the chat. I'll try to pay attention and say hello and get to as many as we can during our time together. But let's get started with your expertise, right? Because you're the expert at helping other people become experts. So I know in the webinar last week, you talked in particular about three particular areas that you have researched and developed over the years as kind of key cornerstones for people to think about. And I'd love for you to share what those are briefly, but also maybe to tell us a little bit about how you came to that conclusion. Because you know, I think you've done a lot of background research before you came to those sort of key salient points. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. So it's, it's very true. From the beginning, I, I started my practice as a coach and a consultant 15 years ago. And like just about anyone in that profession, I immediately started trying to focus in on, okay, you know, how, how can I gain credibility? How can I gain clients? How can I make it easier when I'm meeting people for them to understand what I have to offer or understand that I'm a credible person and not just, you know, one of the, one of the, ocean of pretenders out there. And so I really became obsessed with this question because I realized that, of course, it is infinitely easier if someone already has heard of you, if they already respect you, to be able to do business with them rather than having to come in from a perspective of, of begging or proving yourself or something like that. So mm -hmm. I've really spent the past decade trying to understand the components of what it takes to become a recognized expert in your field. So I've interviewed hundreds of people. I, I wrote a book called Stand Out, How to Find Your Breakthrough Idea and Build a Following Around It. And I even developed an online course and community about becoming a recognized expert. And what I discovered, and I have written about this in Harvard Business Review, is that fundamentally, there are three key components to becoming a recognized expert in your field, whatever that field is. And we can go into far more depth about any of these that are of interest, but briefly, they are content creation, social proof, and your network. And the reason that these are the three key things, that they all kind of tie in together and create a virtuous right. circle, content creation is important because 
if if other people are going to respect you for your ideas, if you are in fact going to be a recognized expert, they need to know what your ideas are. So you have to get them out somehow. Social proof is important. That's basically the external signs of your credibility, the affiliations you have. That is important because there is a world of competitors and you need to give people a reason very quickly to be willing to listen to you. Mm. And then the third part is your network because you need people to help amplify your voice and spread the word about the good work that you're doing. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think it's crucial that you were able to sort of hone in on these three things because this this whole concept of you know becoming a recognized expert is is I know to me in my journey it's been a little bit overwhelming and I think it's true for many of us in the coaching space or in any kind of thought leadership space it's like where do I begin you know it's it's a catch twenty two a little bit right chicken and egg like I know I have something to offer I I want the world to take that and accept it and you know respond to me but it doesn't happen just overnight. It's not like you just wave a flag on LinkedIn and all of a sudden you've got 50,000 people following you. So I'm curious, how did you come to those three things? And, in, and is there a particular order that you learned about them? Yeah, really good question. So ultimately, like a lot of these things, I came to it through a combination of trial and error and, and sort of muddling wow. through on my own, but then also interviewing people who I felt were, were more successful than I was and being able to reverse engineer the process that they had used. So in Stand Out, for instance, I really was interested in this concept of thought leadership. You know, what, what makes someone a thought leader? There's, there's a lot of people obviously with good ideas, but some of them get famous and cited by everybody and some of them right. don't. And so I reached out to people that that you and you know perhaps many of your viewers would have heard of. Um, Tom Peters, a famous management thinker. Robert Cialdini, who's an eminent organizational psychologist, the author of uh, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion. Daniel Pink, who's a best-selling author. Um, those are examples in the business world, but I also reached out to people in a variety of different fields. And I interviewed them in the book Stand Out, essentially about how they got to where they are. Because what I discovered so often in the conventional media narrative around success is that there's there's really kind of only two stories that get told commonly. One is the sort of overnight success, like, whoa, where did they come from? It's a miracle. The star is born. <laughs> yes, right? which I mean, yes, that happens sometimes, but Right. That's not very helpful because it happens, you know, like whatever, one in one in a hundred thousand people is like, oh, there's a there's a sudden miracle and a parting of the heavens. Um, but then on the other end of the spectrum, it's it's just like, oh, okay, if somebody's famous, it's like they've always been famous. It's like, oh, well, from the time the tablets were handed down, <laughs> this person has been famous. So that's just always, always known, famous. right? Yes. And but obviously there there is a wide range of experience in between here and there. And I wanted to know in the early days, what did they do? Literally, what did it what did it look like when no one had heard of Dan Pink? When you know, when it's like, well, you know, who who the heck is that guy? And nobody was paying attention. I wanted to understand those steps and that process that enabled people to break through and actually get heard. And so I really tried to reverse engineer and lay out that process. That's so great. I so appreciate it. You basically did your homework is what it comes down to, right? Before you decided you were going to go out and tell everyone you're an expert on helping other people become an expert, you, you stepped back and thought about, I need to figure out how people actually have become known, right? So that's so totally awesome. Um, I just want to take a minute to say hello because we've got some folks from Denmark. Arizona, Patagonia, Yucatan, Mexico. Oh my God. Hi, Victor from Mexico. Kansas City. Oh my God. Such cool, right? Talk about international. Tampa. Oh, anyway, welcome to everyone. Okay, so here's here's the deal, Dory. I'm gonna be a bit of a psychologist right now with you, right? Okay. All right. I can't help it, it's my training, what can I say? So here's what happened to me when I started to step into the world of wanting to be a thought leader. I immediately bumped up against my jealousy, envy, and fear that I was like, who am I to even know Dory Clark or to even consider being uh, in the same room with Susan David or someone like that, you know? And so did you ever have a sense of 
insecurity or any kind of intimidation around just like picking up the phone and calling Daniel Pink or people like that? And if you, maybe you didn't, but how would you suggest people, <laughs> I finally got over it, but I'm just curious, like how do you get over that intimidation factor? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, it's very easy if there is someone who is quote unquote more famous than you uh, to worry like, oh gosh, well, they're going to say no. And, you know, yeah. they're going to, you know, they're going to think like, who is this peon, <laughs> you know, and this is true in, in any field, right? If you're, if you're a realtor and you want to talk to the famous realtor, well, they feel that too. Um, so ultimately, one of the strategies that I used actually, you know, it becomes it becomes very meta at a certain point. But one <laughs> of the strategies that I used was actually falling back on social proof. Because if we think again about the, the components, the key components of becoming a recognized expert, one of them is social proof, you know, what are the external markers of your credibility? If I were going to a, you know, a celebrity, a thought leader in a given field and saying, Hey, I know you're busy, but can I interview you for my blog that my mom reads? <laughs> you know, right. odds are they're probably not going to say yes. I mean, you might get lucky, but but they're busy and it's probably not that appealing of a proposition. But the question that we all need to ask for ourselves is how do you make it an appealing proposition? What is it that you could do that would that would be meaningful for someone including someone who has stature. And I think too many people view these things as like this kind of fixed thing. Well, like, well, I don't write for a big name publication. I don't blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? You can like, like make it happen. Yes. You know, it's not like, oh, forever. It's been ordained that some people do and some people don't. Right. You work up to this. The way that I started writing for high profile publications was literally, I, I created a spreadsheet of two dozen target publications. And I embarked on a campaign over, you know, a week or so where I filled out that spreadsheet. You know, what's the name of the editor? What's their email address? Hunting online, seeking it out. Does their publication feature outside contributors who are not staff members? Do they feature articles of the kind that I could write? And I cold pitched them. And that was how I was wow. able back in the day to muscle my way into writing for Forbes. And so it, it is a lot easier if you do not personally have credibility to be able to say, oh, hey, Dan Pink. Oh, hey, Jeff Hall. I'm writing a piece for Forbes. I'd like to interview you. Would you be open to that? And odds are they might not have heard of you, but they've heard of Forbes or whatever the given publication is. And they will probably say, sure, why not? And so that's how I was really able to break in and build uh, connections. Yeah, that's really great. So in other words, you, you kind of leveled up yourself by connecting to the social proof, something that would be like a credible um, value add for those individuals that you were reaching out to, right? Forbes yes. or something like that even though you knew yourself that you were not quite there yet. That way you present yourself like you were much more ready to engage with those folks. Absolutely. So it's kind of a, a little variation of you have to fake it to make it to a certain extent, right? I mean, I yeah, think ex true. except it's not fake because right. they are gonna be in Forbes, so yeah. yay. <laughs> that's absolutely true. No, very, very good point. We have a really good question from Sophia. She's asking, and I was gonna ask you something similar. How did you know what your niche would be when you entered into this coaching and consulting space? Yeah. Well, the answer, Sophia, is like, I 100% had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> like the rest of us, you are human. Great. Oh, I feel so much better now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Originally, my idea was that I was actually going to to kind of focus in politics because I, I, had, I had been a spokesperson on political campaigns before. So I thought I was going to be advising political candidates, but it just, you know, it, it just kind of didn't work out that way that when I launched my business, the people who hired me early on were not candidates. They were largely nonprofits or like super small businesses. And so I started there, you know, I just, I was like, mm, all right, you know, I need money. I need clients. I'll go, I'll go where people seem to want me. And so over time I began refining things. Obviously, if a thing that you are talking about, like, like it just completely would not have worked for me when I was starting my business to talk about becoming, you know, oh, well, I help people become recognized experts. Well, you know, hello, you've been a coach five minutes, like, or <laughs> you're not a recognized expert. So what, what the F do you know? Like, yeah. no, that's, you know, that's something that 
over time became a source of fascination for me because I knew it was it was mission critical for my business to figure that out and to crack the code. And so I was able to gain credibility in that space because it was something that I had to, to figure out on my own. But I did not in any way start there. I started with the people that I knew, the clients that I knew. I mean, I was doing work for a lot of like educational nonprofits in Massachusetts. That was like for years, that was a lot of my clients. I, you know, just like little, little tiny organizations. Literally, I consulted for a plumber. There was a plumber. He was, he was, he was sweet. He was so happy. I helped him come up with a name for his plumbing business. I mean, they I did make, all the they're, things. They're the ones that make all the money today anyway. So it's like, you did right. so much you started at the top, right? <laughs> But you also started out and are still a uh, really well known as a communications coach, right? So I'm curious as you know, because it's it's not anyone who can be named the num number one communications coach in the world. It's a little bit intimidating for me because I'm continuously working on my communications and here I am talking to an expert. But, you know, how did you evolve? Because I think this is something really important for all of us that are in coaching or thought leadership evolution is that it's not like you pick a niche and then you, you become attached to it. Like you stay in that lane. Your lane evolves over time, right? As you said, you didn't, becoming the expert on experts is something that happened over time. Talk a little bit about the early days because I know you know you really did become sort of a business school teacher and then a communications expert. So how did the evolution work for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one of the principles that I am a big fan of when it comes to finding your niche or focusing is really just understanding based on the credentials that you have amassed from your past life. Because, you know, most, this is not always true, but for most people, coaching is a second career. You know, for, for most people, they've right. done something before, you know, they worked in the corporate world or they, uh, you know, they had, uh, you know, whatever, they're a psychologist and <laughs> then coaching is something that they add. So it's a question of, of, you know, sort of looking back and it's like, well, what are the unique special skills that I have cultivated that would give me kind of just extra credibility? Like what, you know, what is, what is the excuse that, that I can sort of offer to potential clients? Why it's like, oh, obviously I should hire you. You make unique sense to hire. And so for me, the background that I came out of, which, you know, I mean, in reality, it's like sort of a lot of random disparate things, but I was a journalist and I got laid off from being a journalist. And then I did political communications and I worked on a bunch of losing campaigns. So, <laughs> you know, on one hand, none of that's very auspicious, but on the other hand, it does mean that I had a deep dive into positioning, into communications, into marketing on both sides of it, you know, both understanding how do you present something to the public and also how do you shape that story and that narrative? And so I realized that that was a skill that not everybody had that depth of experience in. And I thought, oh, this is something I can actually do something with. This is this is something that is a little bit unique in the marketplace that uh, that people might be looking for. Yeah, no, I love what you, because what you're saying, I think it, it's so crucial for all of us. Oh, you're not, it happened. You're, I knew you're it not happened. alone. <laughs> He really wants to be interviewed, I can tell. There's your thought leader. Anyway, um, what I was about to say is that I think for all of us, it's it's what you're talking about is this weaving of your expertise and your experience, right? And you were able to sort of synopsize what are the core elements of what I've learned and what I've done, and then out of that carbon niche, and then that niche builds on itself. And then when did you all of a sudden wake up and say, I think I can be an expert on helping other people be experts? Well, I, I think that bef certainly before I said something as presumptuous as that, <laughs> I, I decided that the, the sort of rewinding it, I had written my first book and here we can do, we can do some props here cause I have them on my bookshelf. So I'd written my first book. I have them all on my Kindle, so I can't oh. show you the actual book, but I love I, them all. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. So, so my first book is reinventing you. So I wrote this and then, you know, so that's this book about how, you know, how do you find your, uh, where you want to be professionally? How do you reinvent yourself if you're not exactly in the place you want to be, you know, you want a different job, a different career. 
And so I had steeped myself in that world for quite a while, but I, I came to realize in the course of researching it, in the course of talking about it, that there was like a part two. It's like, well, okay, oh, what comes okay. next? Like, let's say you have successfully reinvented yourself into the right job, the right career. Well, then how do you actually become an expert in that field? Like, how, you know, how do you take it up a notch? And I was interested in that from the perspective of what's the phase two for my readers, but I was also interested in it for myself because I was desperate not to be a commodity as a coach. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how I started researching my book, Stand Out, you know, how to find your breakthrough idea and build a following around it. And so I basically just said, well, I'm going to create a, a research project for myself. And the research project is how do you become a, a thought leader in your field, whatever that field is. And so I certainly wasn't saying at that point, like, oh, I know all about it. I said, I am going to research it and I'm going to interview, you know, 50 plus people who have been able to attain that and then try to analyze and understand the trends. And so it was through the process of those interviews and that analysis that I was able to gain, I guess you could say more authority about that topic and to really um, understand more of, of what the key constituent parts were. And then five years ago, uh, so Standout came out in 2015. And in 2016, I launched a course in an online community called Recognized Expert. And now 600 plus people have been through it. So I feel like Great. in that process, I have gotten a lot of experience, you know, helping people and seeing people uh, go through it. So I, I really, at this point now, can speak with more authority because I have that longitudinal data about people who have actually tried these strategies and, and have been effective. Yeah, no, it's so great. I mean, I think as I'm listening to you, I'm pulling out to me, to my mind as a couple core themes that I think everyone who's watching us today should keep in mind if they're really on the journey to become a thought leader, to become a, a recognized expert. And that's number one, to really look at your own personal journey in terms of what you've learned, who you know, what your interests, your passions are, and what, what your experience gives you like as a grounding because you talked about, you worked in political campaigns, you worked in the school situation, you worked in advocacy groups, you worked. So that funneled your knowledge. But then the second piece, which I think is crucial, crucial is you, before you stepped out in the world and said, I'm the ex guru and X, Y, and Z, you did a re you took it on as a research project, right? To, to talk to people, to learn others' perspectives. And I know that was key for me when I decided I wanted to write a book about leadership I thought, well, this is what I know because I'm working with lots of clients and I have a lot to say. But I realized if I wrote a book just based on Jeff's opinion, might have gone over, you never know. But it certainly helped to interview a lot and to do focus groups with a lot of other coaches to find out whether there was some validation. And I learned so much that, yeah, I would say that this actually, this willingness to take on a research project before you put your work out is really, really profound. Yeah, so, I love that, Jeff. It's it's really is really true. At a certain point, you have earned the right for people to care about what you think, right? <laughs> but but you have to earn that right because up up until then, it's like, well, who are you and why should I bother? And so it's it's through the meticulousness of of your knowledge and your learning and your research that you are able to say, okay, for real, I have legitimate things to say, not just my random opinion. Right. Absolutely true. So. Angela and a couple of other folks are asking us to talk about your next book. But before we do that, we have a few minutes. And I have been wanting to ask you this question ever since I knew I was going to interview you. So I'm not going to pass up the opportunity. And that is that, you know, you're someone who I know puts out a lot of content. You put out newsletter, you put out LinkedIn lives, you put out books, you do consulting, you do coaching, you do classes. And then you actually put out pictures on Friday saying that you're taking ta you're taking the day off <laughs> and having a latte. <laughs> I caught you. And I here's the key. Here's the question. You know, it's it's you're obviously masterful at managing the time to make all those things happen. What tips would you offer to folks to prioritize? Because to be able to do all of those things, you really have to be thoughtful about your time management. So what's your trick, so to speak. Yeah, well, thank you, Jeff. I, I appreciate that. 
I would say there's a, a couple of things. I mean, the first is I am a big fan of batching. Uh, so okay. for instance, if we're talking about writing articles or writing newsletters or things like that, I, at least for me personally, I find that it is often easier to do them in clusters. Um, and because you're, you get in sort of a headspace, it's like, you know, the content creation headspace. And right. so for me, it's far more efficient to write, you know, two articles or three newsletters or something in one go um, over, you know, a morning or something like that, like a full morning, as compared to trying to do it like 20 minutes here and 15 minutes here, where you have to keep refreshing your memory and like, wait, what was point number one? What did I say three weeks ago? Um, so I think batching is, is one key part of it. And also understanding, you know, with my, with my private coaching clients, you know, I advise a lot of entrepreneurs and you know coaches and consultants who are looking to build their own brands as thought leaders and i even just this week i was having a conversation yesterday with one of my clients who was saying oh my gosh i spend so much time on social media i spend so much time you know coming up with my linkedin posts right. and she would spend like 20 minutes like trying to make it perfect and you know come up with all this stuff to say the right thing and I, you know, I, I was listening to her and at a certain point I jumped in and I'm like, I really like, <laughs> I hate to say this, but <laughs> some of the most popular posts I do on LinkedIn, it's not about length. It's not about perfection. Like the ones that get the most response are literally like a picture of me holding a book and smiling, or it's like a, a one sentence aphorism that we're sharing. So sometimes doing the hard thing, doing the hyper laborious thing, it's actually not the most efficacious thing. And we, if we sort of dial it back a little bit and say, well, what, you know, what could we do that would be easier, but just as effective? Um, asking that question can be powerful. I love that. So basically, if you combine the two, right, you figure out what you're trying to accomplish and you batch it into the your best times for writing content, for working with clients, for doing social media and you chunk it, then you can actually not feel like you're scattered all yes. over the place. And also, you know, really focus in on what is your goal as opposed to trying to be an expert and put out some major thing every single time, right? Totally, that's, yes. That's, that's super, super helpful. So tell us in the last couple of minutes about what's happening next for Dory Clark. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you, Jeff. And thank you. Uh, I think uh, Anna is giving a shout out uh, in the comments here to the book. Oh, yes. and Angela She's... asked about it. Right. Uh, so the new book is coming out in September, but you can pre-order it now. Uh, it's called The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World. Uh, so cool. you can actually learn more on my website at doryclark.com slash long game two G's long game. And, uh, <laughs> and basically, you know, I did a course uh, a couple of years ago for LinkedIn learning about strategic thinking. And I was stunned with the response. 1.1 million people have taken this course. There is a lot of interest in being a more strategic thinker. And so I wanted to create a book that basically encapsulated a lot of these ideas about how we can apply strategic thinking to our own careers and our own professional lives. Excellent. Oh, I'm so, I, I can't wait. I mean, I think that given the number of people that are choosing to move into areas like coaching and consulting and becoming entrepreneurs, setting up shops, you know, the idea of how to become known and how to develop a reputation um, and how, how to succeed in a sea of people that are all trying to do it is it's really crucial. And uh, so I just so appreciate that you've taken the time to do the homework, to do the research and uh, absolutely become credible. Uh, you are like walking social proof, as they say. You and what is your adorable animal is just behind you? What is his name? Oh, that is Philip. Philip, yes. If you're All a talent right. agent, send me an email. Philip, <laughs> Philip wants representation. He's ready. Well, we want to thank Philip for making a cameo because that was really, really helpful for our conversation. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to wrap it up and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And uh, I want to encourage everyone that joined us. We got a lot of folks from all over. I hope you will go to the Institute of Coaching's website and take a deeper dive with Dory and me. Um, it's publicly available. and. What's great about that webinar, Dory, is that you took the time and we had a little extra time, you know, we had an hour together and you took a deep dive into those three core elements. 
So if you are a coach that is thinking about how to become a thought leader, where to take your content creation, this will be incredibly helpful, as will looking up all of Dory's incredible work, her newsletters and, uh, and the book that will be out soon. So I just want to thank you for joining us. It's always a pleasure. I hope I did okay. I'm like with the expert, but you, you crushed know. it, man. That was awesome. <laughs> it was great fun being with you, and I look forward to the opportunity to do it again. So thank you, everyone, for joining the Institute of Coaching LinkedIn CoachX Live Conversations. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another amazing interview. So stay tuned. Look us up on LinkedIn if you want to get the latest updates. Um, Carol Kaufman and I do an a intro every month when we uh, figure out who we're going to interview, but it's always someone fascinating like Dory Clark. So join us again. Thank you, everyone. Take care.